Firstly, I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to present today. Uh, my name is Alexander, or Alex, um, and today I'll be talking about uh, just-in-time Python FAS functions as service platforms with Unicraft. Um, and the premise of this talk, essentially, is, uh, oh, actually, a little bit about me. I'm a PhD student um, at Lancaster University, which is just over uh, the, the channel um, uh, in, in the UK. I'm the co-founder and maintainer of an open source uh, project, Unicraft. Um, occasional tweeter, uh, so I use Twitter. Uh, I'm also on GitHub, I'm naturally, and I'm a professional, so I have LinkedIn. Um, but uh, the premise of today's talk, and to get into how Python is involved in everything here, and how uh, functions as a service is developing into the sort of 21st century, and, and how things are looking in today, is that higher cluster utilization and with decreased operational expenditure. So basically, to break this down, you know, we want to spend less to do more. Um, we want to run, uh, you know, our microservices in the cloud. We want that to be cheap. We want to be able to run more of those same services on maybe less hardware. Uh, we want to use less physical resources, uh, less virtual resources. Um, and so, uh, and this is, a, this is, I think, a pretty common theme. I think we can all sort of agree on this idea and this topic, and we can try and find and see a lot of things that are moving in that direction in sort of the developer space. And, so that's kind of the premise of today's talk, and I'm going to go into how we can achieve this with one strategy for the cloud, um, which is today's talk. Um, so let's talk about the bloat problem that uh, applications have in the cloud. Um, and the bloat problem is that you have your application um, that you want to put into the cloud, or you want to run an edge service or, or something, um, and um, it's comprised of your Python app. But it's also comprised of the Python runtime, um, the container runtime, if you're running things with containers. It could also just be uh, the process manager of the operating system. And it can't quite see it, but it does say operating system underneath. Um, but yeah, so you have, a, you have a very big stack, actually. Um, and if you've built an application um, and you're using libraries or whatever, you usually have a good idea of what are in those libraries, um, or at least uh, the functionality that's going to be occurring in your application, which means that there are actually quite a lot of things in the typical deployment that aren't actually being used, right? For example, you might never actually use uh, SSL in your application. Not that you should, you probably should, but you get the premise. You might not be doing an encryption uh, type uh, function within the application that you're building. Um, this applies to any other type of operation. But encryption, all these other sort of standard applications or uh, libraries, that you might be aware of or might want to use would still be available in most deployment scenarios. And they're typically also very much available within the kernel and within the operating system, right? The shared libraries are almost always there, and the kernel almost always has functionality that's part of that system that you just can't really remove. So when you look at your, your actual application, it's doing what you want, great, fantastic, but it's not doing you know, other things, which it could, it could do, but it, you know, there are libraries there that are being unused. And this is actually part of this premise, right? This is a problem with the cloud is that, you know, you want to get more use out of the hardware and the virtual resources that you're trying to run, but you're actually packaging in other things that you don't need. So here is an example of, of, of how we can try and remove these, these things. And how, so today I'm going to talk about how we can do that and sort of one way to approach this problem. So, this is where I get to introduce you unikernels. This is something that I've been researching for a while, something that I work on pretty much every single day. It's an amazing uh, sort of technology that I really believe in, and I'm very uh, honored today to be able to introduce you to the topic. Maybe you've heard of it before, but if you haven't, I'm very honored to be able to tell you about it. Um, and so the unikernel model is a sort of idea of looking at the full stack of uh, your, your system, right? So if you think about your application at the top, this application has third-party libraries that you're aware of. You know, in Python, you're importing things. Those are those libraries, but there are also libraries within the operating system itself. These are shared uh, objects, um, so like libssl or uh, you know, anything else. Um, and then you have the monolithic kernel underneath that facilitates the runtime of everything else, including your application, but also maybe other applications or other runtimes or um, et cetera. And then this finally then you know, sits on top of a platform 
Um, so this is like a hypervisor, uh, or you know, if it's deployed in the cloud, so it could be Zen, it could be KVM, um, and then that finally sits on top of hardware. So we look at this whole model and we break it down because when we break it down and we introduce this idea of a library operating system, we can then start to pick and choose exactly what we want to run into. Uh, um, and this is, this is what a unikernel is. So you take all the different components that you do need and not the ones that you don't need, right? And through a process of yeah, compiling it, linking, et cetera, uh, through this build process, you get a unikernel. And a unikernel is this bespoke image, is a bespoke uh, in the context of a cloud, it's a virtual machine, or you can also deploy it as an edge. Uh, and, you, know, you can put it on a Raspberry Pi, for example, and then that Raspberry Pi would only ever do that one thing. Um, but it only has the you know, application-specific libraries, the kernel-specific libraries. It's targeted directly for that platform, um, and you know, it has only the code that's necessary to run on that particular piece of hardware. Um, which is the case of actually most uh, kernels, right? You usually get the architecture-specific kernel binary images, but usually they have additional code in there to allow for different platform runtimes. Um, okay, so this is the kind of model um, that uh, what Unicraft offers. And so oh, maybe go through some of the uh, sort of key characteristics of uh, Unicrons, um, uh, is that, so they're a form of compile time specialization, meaning that you can think of it like through the DevOps pipeline, where you have your application and you're you know, bundling it with pip and, and you're, you're getting every, all the dependencies. Finally, you're building it and it comes, you know, the output is the final kernel image, right? You're not taking that image and then shipping it and then putting it on top of something else. It is the final artifact in the sense that it is going to be running as a virtual machine. Um, they're very lightweight. I'm gonna get into a little bit later about how lightweight they are and do some comparisons. Um, they have a unique property of being having a single shared address space. So in um, most monolithic kernels, uh, user space and kernel space are two different spaces that result in uh, uh, checks for privileges, right? Do I have the permission to read this file, for example? This is a check um, because they are part of two different memory address spaces. Um, in the context of the unikernel, this is one of the same because you know that your application is wanting to read that file, for example, uh, or is wanting to perform this particular type of operation. It is allowed to do that because it has been bundled together. Uh, so there are no syscalls. Um, and so syscall like open, uh, socket, uh, close, et cetera. Um, these are usually um, you know, a barrier, a check, right? That performs, I think it's around 300 CPU cycles of just like, can this user space program do the exactly, yes, okay, can it, can it not, whatever, and returns an error or doesn't, uh, and then it continues. Because this syscall is now a function call, um, it's like four CPU cycles. It just hops to the functionality that it needs to go to. Um, it has no other functionality that is not necessary, right? Um, uh, and there are no daemons that are running in the background, no system libraries, and there's no SSH, for example. So. A lot of, you know, a big attack vector for a lot of virtual machines is that SSH is just left, left open, for example. Um, so these are some, some of the characteristics of unikernels. Uh, yeah, naturally platform hardware specific. Um, and Unicraft, uh, which I'd like to talk to you today about, um, is a library operating system and a unikernel development kit. Um, it's open source. You can find it at unicraft.org. Um, we're also on GitHub. Uh, please uh, do check it out. Um, and we have a lot of CLI tooling that is written in Python, so hopefully it can fit in the uh, theme of what uh, this conference is all about. Um, and uh, also, so you know, we are a Linux Foundation project and a Zen incubator project. Um, so we have quite a, a good sitting in the community as well. Um, to talk about the community, um, Unicraft has a foot in a lot of academic institutes, and so we do kind of publications once in a while that do a lot of measurements and uh, explore certain properties within sort of the library operating system model. Um, and uh, so sort of some of these are the partners as well, uh, the university partners, um, where you can see the methodology and like why we're approaching uh, library operating systems in the way that we are. Um, and uh, I think every time that we've had a paper that has had sort of experiments in it, um, those experiments are also open source. 
So you can check them out on GitHub. You can run the same experiments and see how they're performed and then why we're getting, when we do comparisons, the same or different or better uh, performance or security, etc. cetera. Um, we have quite a big uh, active community uh, of contributors um, and uh, uh, sort of constantly on, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis we're, we're like seeing new contributions and sometimes you know, people add amazing uh, uh, new features just sort of out of the blue. So it's really amazing to watch. Um, and we've been sort of steadily growing over time. Uh, so if you could star us on GitHub, this would make this chart better, please. Um, yeah, okay. We also have a very good uh, uh, Discord. Uh, community is very active. Um, and there's also a lot of like conceptual uh, channels. So if you're like into kind of operating system stuff, there's a lot of students on there and like professors who are also like mentoring, uh, who have a lot of experience. Um, and so uh, we talk about sort of how best to implement, for example, uh, a particular internal library. Uh, a lot of stuff going on at the moment, for example, SMP. What are good abstractions for SMP that are platform independent? It's really amazing to watch. Um, but so this, is, this is our Discord channel. OK, so um, the next few sets of slides are basically um, to do with like to show how Unicraft compares to other existing technologies. Um, so Unicraft has provided uh, better performance uh, compared to uh, other um, implementations of Unikernel projects. There are several others um, that exist that we are aware of um, that are basically, uh, they also, you know, they have their own unique ways to approach uh, the problem of the library operating system. But this uh, graphic also shows a comparison against Linux um, and Linux, uh, so this is bare metal Linux, just sort of a user space, uh, uh, in this case is Nginx that we're running on um, on Linux, and then we just you know perform a, a throughput and a, uh, a latency test on, on Nginx. So we run it on Linux, then we run it inside a virtual machine, and then we also try different um, implementations of the platform, so we also have Firecracker on there. Um, when it comes to uh, memory consumption and storage, because you're only using the minimum amount of uh, resources that are actually necessary to run your application, we find that there are much less, um, uh, you know, we can use a lot less resources um, to run the same application. Uh, and so compared to uh, Docker uh, and compared to uh, Linux as a micro VM, right, you have to actually use uh, uh, we really tried to squeeze it, right? We tried to make the minimum amount of uh, resources possible, so we really deleted uh, things uh, with inside Linux, for example, to try and make sure that we weren't uh, trying to make the experiment as fair as possible. And, and because it's such a well-defined, well-compiled uh, source, um, and the resulting artifact is very minimal and very lean, uh, we can sort of get quite good memory consumption. And here we do a comparison. Um, where you can just see if you pull the official Docker image for Python um, and the same version as well. Um, the official one is like 335 megabytes. Um, and then trying to be fair, I, pu I pulled the Alpine uh, version for the latest. Uh, it's 27 megabytes, but we have, uh, um, uh, when you compile Python, uh, sort of the Python interpreter, and then you compile that against Unicraft, uh, the, like final image, including the file system that contains uh, the same Hello World program and all of the you know, sort of standard libraries that are inside of Python. The final result is 5.2 megabytes. Um, so um, part of our team um, really love diving into trying to make things performance, and this is a latest result that they uh, were able to get. Um, this was Nginx, um, but they were able to show P99.99 like latency, which is absolutely crazy. I've never seen it before. Um, comparing uh, Unicraft um, with Linux, um, and to show that there's a sort of, a, uh, you can't really see, this, the, I don't think the lines are showing up, but it's like between five and two uh, milliseconds is the difference between uh, Linux and um, Unicraft. Um, comparing um, virtual machine monitors, and so CAMU, uh, Solo 5, which is sort of historically a, a unikernel, um, virtual machine monitor, recently Firecracker as well. Uh, comparing the boot time of a guest image that it comes from with, and this is just this is just Unigraph. Um, we can we've seen as low as 3.1 milliseconds booting the virtual machine image on these uh, virtual machine monitors, uh, or via these virtual machine monitors. Um, so uh, if you tune your uh, Unikernel to a specific way, you can really exploit, for example. Um, 
not having to initialize uh, so much memory, you can do it statically if you know you're only going to use a certain much amount of memory, which means that you don't have to preemptively do things. And because there's no things like um, system D, for example, there's no initialization of additional services, it boots straight to main. Um, okay, um, so because we're a library operating system and because there are a lot of libraries within the library operating system, um, there's a lot of optimizations that you can tweak and do with throughout um, the place. So you can you can choose different um, settings with inside different libraries to exploit, for example, the use case that you're trying to use for your application. Um, and a couple of like default high level uh, optimization techniques you can run on Unicraft are link time optimization, dead code elimination, dead code elimination. Um, and even combining them. Um, and you can see that we can even reduce the image size further. So which means if you're like transporting the image across the data center, it's much less uh, throughput on the wire. Um, because you're not bundling a lot of additional services, um, you know, whether it's in a Docker container or on a virtual machine, because it's a unicorn and you don't have any of these other stuff, you have a much smaller reduced attack surface. Uh, because there's no shell, because there's no idea, you know, no concept of a user, um, there's no like GID, UID, etc. Um, there's no background processes, there are no additional ports that you wouldn't be aware of. Um, because there are none of this, the attack surface is much smaller. But because you're dealing directly with the kernel and your application is sitting on top and you're sort of tightly coupling the two, um, and because they're bundled together, you can exploit a lot of additional security properties. For example, uh, address space layout randomization. Um, uh, Arguably as well, uh, because it's a virtual, if you do use virtual machines and you do run things as a, as a virtual machine, you're exploiting the lowest level of virtualization. So this is sort of deemed the most secure uh, privilege. Um, usually when you see deployments in the cloud, uh, containers are usually deployed on top of a virtual machine anyway. And so the virtual, ma virtual, uh, virtual machine still sort of represents the unit uh, of security that is sort of experienced within infrastructure service providers. As a project, we also have a whole bunch of other security implementations uh, uh, that are being worked on at the moment. Uh, so this is a sort of a list of example. It's actually a little bit out of date. I just took a screenshot from our documentation. Uh, several of these have made their way to become upstream. Um, and we're constantly seeing new different ways uh, to increase the security of uh, the uh, like project basically. Um, so what does Unicraft support? No, naturally Python actually was one of the very first applications that we got running on Unicraft. Um, but we support a whole bunch of other languages and uh, libraries and applications. And actually this list is not, it's, it's not exhaustive because we're binary compatible. So if you have a binary compatible, um, if you have built something in Linux that is a binary, you can actually just load that into Unicraft and it will do um, jump call between instructions. Um, so this is how it sort of talks to the kernel. Um, we also support a number of different libc's. Um, so we have a built-in libc um, called no libc, uh, which is like the minimal amount of libc we found to get a you know, kernel running. Um, and then we support out of the box Zen and KVM, and then as well as Arch. And actually, uh, our, these are the sort of the built-in. If you clone the repo, this is what you get out of you know, the default. This is what you can configure. Um, um, but uh, as a sort of larger ecosystem, we support newlib. Um, we have, this should have come later, arm, so we have arm out of the box. But muscle, we're gonna have muscle uh, as a libc. This should be, I think, in September. Um, so in like about two months, we'll have muscle support. And this basically opens the door for a lot of things uh, for us because it's a lot simpler and nicer implementation, at least in our opinion. Um, and then we have ongoing support for, or they're busy being built at the moment, Hyper-V and RISC-V. Um, and so you can see here, uh, we have some screenshots of Unicraft booting and, and running on Hyper-V uh, here on VMware. Um, and then out of the blue, uh, open source contributor came out, was like, hey, I made RISC-V. We were just like, awesome, okay, cool. Um, so that's that, and you can run it, of course, on a Raspberry Pi and other, you just build, this is an abstract interface you can build against any hardware platform. Um, so with regard to integration, um, so we have a number of different toolings and, and ways that you can, you might think, okay, look, it's a kernel. How do I work with a kernel? Uh, this, is, this, is, this is out of the breadth of my, my, my gamut, et cetera. Um, but we have tools and services that can make things much easier um, so that it doesn't seem so scary. Um, I know that when I started, I was like, oh my God, what am I doing as a kernel? What? 
Um, but uh, so we have, first of all, VS Code, we have a VS Code integration. Um, and basically here, um, it's, you can already search for it on the uh, VS Code marketplace, um, where you then sort of load it up. And when you're building a project, you can then see on the side um, the like libraries that you might want to add to your kernel, um, or to your uni kernel, right? So on the Explorer side here, um, it will load up and show all the different libraries that have been loaded. And you can, these are like third party libraries that you might necessarily need. So if you're like importing something from uh, pip and you, it says, you know, maybe you've been done pip before, it's like, oh, I'm missing this thing. So you do apt get install, uh, whatever dev headers, this is the equivalent, um, but through VS Code. Uh, I'll skip through this due to time. So we, our main tool uh, is called craft, and this is written in Python. Um, not only is it a CLI uh, tool, but it's also like a API, so you can import it and you can build unikernels uh, sort of programmatically. Um, it allows you to manage uh, multiple libraries from different sources, whether they're Git repos, etc. Manage the versions, etc. Um, you define your unikernel through a specification file, a YAML file, that just says, look, I want to target x86 on KVM, and these are the libraries that I need. Um, you most likely will need new lib, uh, LWIP. Uh, these are uh, sort of standard libraries for uh, libc and networking. Um, and then you just you know call configure and you do menu config. In fact, I can even quickly show you uh, with a short, short demo. Here I have a Python application. Um, it's a, a craft file that you see here. And then I have a file system that I've made through virtual uh, env. So if I tree fs0, Python to less. You'll just see that you'll have activate, etc. You have the pip binary. Here I have my hello world pi program, and then sort of all the standard uh, things that have come through pip, etc. And then I can do craft sort of menu config. Um, this is when craft is installed, and then it opens up um, something like this. If you've ever built a Linux kernel, it looks a little bit similar. It's very simple uh, sort of terminal user interface. And then here I can just sort of pick the libraries that I want. And down here I can even go down and customize the Python 3 uh, build itself. So I can choose whichever extensions I would like. And then it's just a case of craft build. Uh, or maybe I should show you what the craft file looks like. So here I just sort of specify config options, um, sort of things I would like. Um, this is, if you like follow the tutorial, it's all out of the blue. Um, uh, not out of the blue, out of the repo on the readme, you'll be able to see it just is like just a couple of uh, installs uh, or like CLI calls. Uh, and then this is all there already. I just kind of done a fresh clone. You do craft build. Um, okay, maybe I should do it fast. <gasps> An error. You never saw that. Okay. That's because I did control C. Okay. And then it just sort of zips through and just compiles all the stuff and then. Um, so these are all the libraries that I needed to build Python 3 as a unikernel. And then out should pop a binary. And then a binary, you should be able to uh, boot as a virtual machine. So here it's just linking, it's linking the extensions. And then can you guess is like a shell script that is part of the install. If you do pip3 install uh, on the craft repo, it will be installed as well because it's part of the setup utils or setup tools. Um, then I'm just pointing to the kernel, so dash k. I'm passing in a file system. It's like if you've ever done docker run and then dash v, dash e is the same. Um, I'm giving it 128 megs of RAM. Uh, and then I'm saying, um, you know, hello world is my mate, like my first positional argument is like hello world.py. So if I, you know, I'll just boot. So now it's booting from a ROM, there's unikernel, and it says hello world. So I can then just change this, for example. Uh, hello world. Hmm. If I do the same thing, you'll see. Yeah. Yay. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So these. I mean, this is just the installation of dependencies that you need to get everything to run. This is uh, part of the tutorial. Uh, on the uh, documentation. And this is pip3 to get this is sort of the repo um, where craft exists. Um, 
I'll skip through this. So we also have uh, Kubernetes um, integration. And something I wanted to get into, this is what this function as a service comes to. Um, and I'd like to talk about uh, another one of these sort of problems with the sort of number of abstractions that you see in typical deployments. So this is a typical function as a service deployment with open FAS, where you have, uh, and with Kubernetes, through FASnetes. Um, and so you have the system, kube system pods that are mingling on top of container D. Then you have a uh, FAS namespace that's mingling amongst a container D. And then you have FAS D, which is a binary that invokes the different uh, functions that you would like to run. Um, and so here, this is how the request comes in and sort of jumps through all these different services. Um, and the problem here is that we have all these levels of virtualization, right? You're sitting at the hypervisor, you've then got the OS, then on top of that, the sort of OS is managing all that is not just managing container D, FASD is also managing SSHD, et cetera. Container D, FASD, whatever, they're managing things on top of this. And then inside of your service, ultimately, you might even be managing more stuff. So there's lots of levels of uh, virtualization here, lots of abstraction, lots of slowness, right? The, the performance might not be so good because you're sort of going all the way up. So if you can run something as a virtual machine on top of the hypervisor, right, you're going to be using a lot less resource. You're going to be closer to the metal. You're going to be providing better service, uh, better service, quality of service. Um, I'll skip this if it lets me. Ooh. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, Prometheus, I wanted to show that we, as a kernel, we have integration with Prometheus, so you can see uh, the runtime of your services, um, building this as a library as part of the deployment. Um, and then debuggability, um, as a kernel, you might think, okay, wow, okay, how do you debug a kernel? Well, um, you can do printf, just like any other programming language <laughs> inside of the kernel. So this, and there's some nice debugging libraries that you can in, sort of I enable, uh, so in that, menu config that I showed you before in the terminal, you just go to the debug stuff and it's like enable all the debugging stuff and then you start to see lots of verbose uh, messaging as you boot stuff. And you can even enable unit testing which we have inside of the kernel. Um, and you can also do profiling. So we have a number of tools that allow you to see the runtime of your application on top of the runtime of the kernel. So you can see which system calls are being run in, on there as well. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, this is the Unicraft project. Um, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'll take any questions. Um, I was told to say that the mic is over here if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you. Hey, uh, that was a really great talk and Thank a really you. great tool. Uh, so my question is, because I, I wasn't the first part of the talk, but my question is, so is there actually a, like a difference between user space and kernel space as in usual OS? No, there's, so, no, there's no separation. So this means everything runs in kernel space, right? That's right, yes. Okay, so how do you leverage things like uh, SLR? Are you just basically like putting things randomly in memory? I mean, as, it, it's, as it's usual with your SLR? Uh, so with ASLR, it's done at compile time, um, where we understand the application. Uh, in this case, it would be the Python 3 interpreter and the rest of the kernel, and this is where it uh, occur. So is there some actual ASLR that is going on when you boot the application, so or is it like once, it compile, when, once it's compiled, whenever mm -hmm. you deploy it, the addresses are all the same? So this is a, it's a really good question. Um, this is current ongoing. It's best to have a conversation offline about this. Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Um, I've seen you mentioned uh, well, other unique kernels. I wondered if you compared it to Gramine, which is used to be oh, Graphene. Oh, Graal, uh, Gramine. Uh, Gramine, no. Gramin, uh, no, no, we haven't. And uh, if you have ever considered using, uh, well, for security purposes today, SGX enclaves of uh, Yes, yeah, so we have a Google Summer of Code student working on enclaves right now. Oh, cool. Yeah. Hello, uh, great talk, very interesting. Uh, so in the demo, you showed that you were editing the Python file and mm -hmm. running without yes. compiling. Uh, in which case do you need to recompile uh, the... So you don't have to recompile the kernel to get... Uh, the, so what I did there was I have 9PFS. 9PFS is sort of a network protocol that then talks to the host. And so it basically it read through a network protocol a mounted volume 
um, that was the file system. Um, there are other ways to make that file system available to the kernel, for example, through init RAM. And so I could package that, fi that file system that you saw that had the hello world.py uh, program as an init RAM file. Um, I would then boot that as the init RAM. Um, and, but there are other ways to do it. You could also package the init RAM with the kernel into like a QCOW2 image, or actually we have ongoing work to make this available as OCI archive, so it's compatible with the rest of the uh, sort of Kubernetes and container uh, uh, space, and we have, an we have a tool that makes this possible, um, where it looks like a container, it feels like a container, <laughs> but actually it's a unit kernel, uh, and we'll be releasing more of these tools in September open source. All right, thanks. No worries, thank you. Thank you.